Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar this, this evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. My name's Helene and I'm from West Vic PHN. Alongside me running the webinar is Joe Rose from our Health Pathways team and Katrina Pilgrim from um, our Ballarat office. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar and thank you for attending. Majority, the majority of our webinar events are recorded and freely available on our PHN Learn YouTube channel. We do have a practice communique that we send out to all practices fortnightly with valuable information, including an external calendar of events and internal calendar of events. For this evening's meeting, participants attending will be put on mute for the course of the meeting. Should you have any questions, just type them in the question box and, you're, and they will be answered during the course of the meeting. I, I, I do that through, I'll answer them on your behalf, but it'll be all anonymous, so you won't be identified at all. Our presenter for this evening is April Burnett, who's the Provider Adoption Lead Partnerships and Clinical Use Office of the CWO. Um, please make note of the West Vic PHN Health Pathway relating to the topic that is on the screen at the moment. I will hand over to Jo Rose from our Health Pathway team to speak on this slide, and then we will go directly to April for this evening's presentation. Thanks, Jo. Over to you. Thanks, Aline. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jo Rose, and I'm the Health Pathways Program Officer at Western Victoria Primary Health Network. I'm going to provide a brief introduction to the electronic prescribing related pathways on our website. For those unfamiliar with Health Pathways, Health Pathways is an online clinical platform designed to support primary care clinicians. It contains many locally agreed condition-based guidelines and local referral information. Pathways are written by clinical editors in collaboration with specialists, subject matter experts, peak bodies and agencies according to best evidence and in consideration of the local context. You'll see on the slide a sample of pathways relevant to this evening's content. Health Pathways teams across Victoria have worked together to develop the electronic prescribing page, which includes how to prepare for electronic prescribing, writing a script using the interim special arrangement for image-based prescribing, writing an electronic script using the token model, delivery arrangement for PBS and RPBS medications, and patients with existing paper prescriptions or repeats who are confined to their homes. Health Pathways now has over 800 clinical referral and resource pathways available. The Western Victoria Health Pathways team has also developed the first national primary care pathways for COVID-19 and are currently working with federal and state level clinical experts in the development of the national COVID-19 vaccination guidance for primary care. So please do keep an eye on PHN communications for the release of this comprehensive resource. The login details to access Health Pathways have been provided in the chat thread and are also available in the Health Pathways handout. This is a generic login that can be used for all of your healthcare team. However, passwords are only provided to general practitioners, health professionals and key primary care staff in the Western Victoria region as the site is not designed to be accessed by the general public. If you have any questions regarding Health Pathways, please feel free to email us at healthpathways at westvicphn.com.au. I will now hand over to April. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Joe, and thanks, Helene. Um, I'll just quickly share my screen. I won't be a tick. There we go, and I'll just double check that we have the right screen sharing, so that should be loading soon. So um, good evening, everyone. My name's April Burnett. Um, I'm a provider adoption lead from the Australian Digital Health Agency. It's really, really great to see quite a lot of attendees um, on the line tonight to learn a little bit more about electronic prescribing. Before I start, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we're all meeting on. I'd like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge and extend that respect to other um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us this evening. So tonight we're going to be running through an overview of electronic prescribing. Um, I'm going to detail what's available now, which you might have already used um, already in your practice, which is the token model. And we'll run through the core features and functionalities of this token model. And then we'll move on to looking at what's to come in the future. So you might have heard of the active script list and I'll give you a little bit more insight into what you'll be seeing um, later on in 2021 with the active script list. Then we'll be touching on um, a little bit more detail on how you can prepare your practice to engage with electronic prescriptions, which you might have already done as well. 
And then we're going to pause for some questions um, on electronic prescribing. So I do encourage you to post any questions or experiences you've had in the um, chat bar um, and then Helene can help me answer those um, midway through. Then once we're done with electronic prescriptions, we'll um, we'll move on to giving a brief overview to um, pathology electronic requesting um, and we'll have a, another opportunity at the very end for some more questions. So before I dive into electronic prescriptions, I want to give a little bit of background to the um, national digital health strategy that the Australian Digital Health Agency has developed. So there's seven areas of priority, um, which you'll be able to see on the screen now, and this has been created in consultation with the Australian community and healthcare providers. And what this found was that people want their health information to be confidential and secure. Then on a healthcare provider um, point of view, we see that providers want secure digital services that are going to provide instant access to patient information. And they also want technology to reduce the administration burden um, so that they can spend more time with patients and less time with paper. And I'm sure that definitely rings true um, for a few of you in your practice. So some of the areas of priority that you would have heard of before include the My Health Record system, which aims to provide health information um, available wherever and whenever it's needed. You also might use secure messaging um, in your practice too, which is another priority of ours. And then um, some other um, common priorities too, like interoperability and data quality. But tonight, of course, we're going to be focusing on medicine safety, which is the arm that electronic prescriptions falls under, and that aims to have better availability and access to prescriptions and medicines information. So right now we're witnessing quite a significant change in the way that medicines are prescribed and dispensed. Um, if we think back to um, before computers were used in in healthcare, um, prescriptions were purely written on paper and then they moved to more com computer generated version. And we've seen that evolve over time with the introduction of programs like the electronic transfer of prescription. Right now, we're experiencing a bit of a change with um, the adoption of electronic prescriptions, which is or can be a um, completely paperless journey for the patient to receive a prescription um, through a QR code. So electronic prescriptions, it is an alternative to paper prescriptions. It's not mandatory, so it is only an option for prescribers and their patients. The benefit of having this electronic prescription is that it might be more convenient for patients. It complements telehealth services and there's also numerous clinical safety benefits um, that come along with that too. Previously, only a paper prescription signed by a prescriber has been the legal form by which medicines can be supplied. Um, so you needed that, that physical piece of paper with the signature of the prescriber. Then um, we saw in 2019, there was a national level legislation change, and that was um, recognizing an electronic prescription as an alternative legal form by which medicines can be supplied. And since that time in 2019, um, the Department of Health and the Digital Health Agency have been working together to create the technical solution for electronic prescriptions. So creating the back end um, sort of solution of what, what that QR code looks like and how that, that um, prescription is generated on practice software and transferred to pharmacy. So that work, of course, last year was fast-tracked under COVID-19, and we now see uh, most of the technical solution for electronic prescriptions complete. So you might have already used um, the electronic prescription system within your practice, um, but most definitely it is an option available to you right now. The uptake of electronic prescribing has been very encouraging over the last 12 months and um, Victoria is leading the way. So we can see here that Victoria um, has issued over 1 million electronic prescriptions to date and this is increasing quite significantly at the moment. From a pharmacy aspect, we have um, over 1,400 pharmacies in Victoria that have dispensed electronic prescriptions. And on the right pane there, we see that 100% of PBS approved pharmacies um, have, have dispensed at least one electronic prescription as of the 12th of January this year. So all that uptake um, 
by general practice and also pharmacy has also been complemented by the really excellent feedback that we've received from consumers who have um, highlighted that the process is quite easy and convenient for them. Now let's have a look at the ways in which um, patients can receive electronic prescriptions. So we'll first have a look at this token model, um, which you might have heard of before. So the token, it's essentially the core feature of electronic prescriptions. It's, um, it's used in the active script list model as well. So it is quite important that you're familiar with the function of the token. So essentially the token is a QR code, which we're all very familiar with the look of a QR code at the moment. And it's, um, it's basically a key to unlock the prescription and it's held on the patient's mobile device or it can also be printed. That um, QR code token is sent, um, well, it's generated from a practice software. So you will have, have to connect your um, clinical information system to electronic prescriptions. And then if you decide to generate a token, you'll have the opportunity to deliver this to either the patient's um, mobile phone through SMS um, you can send it to their email address and it can also be printed as well. This um, token also, it's, it's one prescription item per token too. So um, the token, and we'll have a look at this in the next um, slide, it does have minimal details in it. And um, as I said before, that QR code, it acts as a evidence of prescription, which um, it doesn't have too many prescription details on it. It will be the pharmacy software and the scanning devices that will retrieve um, all the information once they scan that QR code. So this, um, this avenue of receiving an electronic prescription, it has been available since May last year. And we saw that with all the um, different statistics that have been available and the really great use that we've seen of the token. And that um, occurred through a staged rollout and we're seeing that 100% um, rolled out within Victoria now. And then um, as we progress through 2021, we will be um, releasing a token management solution, which we refer to as the active script list. So I'll touch on that in a second. But first, I'll give you a quick snapshot of what this token will look like. So this is an example of the token being delivered through text message, where the patient's going to receive a text message, which we see on the left. And then there'll be a link where it says tap to view your script. Once that link is selected, it will open up the QR code. It has the medicine name, strength, um, also the date the prescription was supplied. And we can see on these two examples here, the one on the left has one supply remaining and the one on the right has six su supplies remaining. So there's not too many um, details on this token. So we're not seeing things like the patient's address or any identifiable pieces of information. It's only when that, that QR code is scanned um, at a pharmacy that's connected to electronic prescriptions, which will then download the full prescription details for the patient. When the patient then opens their token, it can also display different messages um, relating to the state of the prescription. So this might be if the, the prescription's been cancelled or, or the prescription's expired. So we can see some examples on the screen now. One on the left has the prescriptions already expired. Middle one has the prescriptions already been dispensed and then we have the prescription has been ceased by the prescriber. So we see what's consistent through these three screenshots is that there's no QR code on that, um, that screen now. So that means that the patient won't be able to have that prescription scanned at the pharmacy and therefore um, won't be able to get that prescription because it's either expired, been dispensed already, or um, it's been ceased. That's one, um, another point to, to make out as well from prescribing software too, you will have the capability to cancel a prescription in which that um, message that we see on the right is going to exp um, display there. So as I said, this token solution is available now. And then what we'll see soon is the token management solution, the active script list being released. So here's a little bit more details around the active script list. So it is a token management solution. They aren't two separate ways of receiving an electronic prescription. 
Um, some people like to refer to the active script list as um, an area where you keep a bag of tokens, um, I've heard, but essentially it's just a list of all the current um, electronic prescriptions that are available for that patient. So this solution, it is only being rolled out in test sites at the moment. So you might not um, or um, probably haven't seen this solution in your practice yet. And a full national expansion, it's yet to come. So at the moment you can um, expect that your patients are only going to be using tokens, so they'll be managing their electronic prescriptions in individual tokens. And then this active script list, which will be essentially a list of all their tokens, it's going to be introduced throughout 2021. So the benefit of the active script list is that it removes the need to keep track of um, an individual's um, prescription items in SMS um, or email form. So it means that instead of managing individual prescription items on my phone, I can actually have the pharmacist assist me when I, when I go to the pharmacy to retrieve that list of active um, prescriptions, then we can decide which ones I need dispensing on that day. This will be a staged rollout, so there's um, different releases coming with the active script list, and the initial rollout will be a pharmacy-centric model, where the patient will have to register at their local pharmacy first to set up an active script list, and that functionality isn't available yet, but there uh, will be more information to come once this is released. So the way that it will work is that the um, first and foremost, the patient will attend a pharmacy um, and request to be registered for an active script list, and the patient will need to accept the terms and conditions and agree that all their prescriptions will go to the active script list unless they withdraw their consent. The next step is that the patient will attend a doctor's appointment and a prescription will be issued as per the normal process. And if um, it will, is a prescription that's an electronic prescription, um, they, they will automatically be added to the patient's active script list unless they ask the, the doctor not to add that to the ASL. So if the patient does have an active script list, it'll be sent there, but also there's the opportunity to send it as an individual token um, in addition to that too. So they can also receive the SMS or the email with a copy of the token. And of course, a, um, another copy will be available on their ASL. Then once that has all been received, the patient then presents at their preferred pharmacy. They'll um, validate their identity as per the normal processes and make sure they've provided consent to the pharmacy to view their ASL. And then the pharmacy is able to look at their list of medicines that are available to be dispensed. And then once they select that, it will retrieve the full prescription details down from the prescription delivery service to dispense the right medication. Then if there are repeats, um, depending on the patient's preference, these repeats can be added to the active script list as well, and they can also be sent as a separate token um, to the patient's phone or, or email. So this solution, um, as I've reiterated, it is coming soon, and there will be test sites that are being deployed that um, validate this technology and confirm the workflow solution for the active script list. So more information will be available once those have been um, released. At the moment, I think um, the best way to prepare for the active script list is to start issuing electronic prescriptions under the token solution. And this would be just to get familiar get familiar with the process of not using paper and um, having your patients more familiar with the process of receiving their electronic prescription through a QR code because it still will be an option too if they, they decide to go with the active script list there. So there are a few ways to manage electronic prescriptions and we've had a look at the token model which we see on the left there um, and also a bit of a snapshot into what's to come with the active script list. But there's also a few different other avenues that will be options for patients to manage their prescriptions. So it has been designed around patient choice and we can also see some screenshots here um, of examples of how a patient can use a mobile app to store tokens. The difference with this will be that uh, they'll be able to essentially keep a wallet of all the tokens that they have received via SMS or email or within a, an application that might offer some extra functionality on medication management for the patient. Another option is that um, a patient can elect that a carer or an agent receives the token um, as an SMS or email on behalf of them. And that also rings true with the active script list too. So um, 
patients can can decide to have um, other people manage their active script list on behalf of them. So there are different options available for managing electronic prescriptions. But uh, one thing that is consistent with all of these different management options is that the QR code is available in all those instances, whether it's being handled by a carer or the QR code being retrieved from the active script list. Now, what can electronic prescriptions be used for? So the solution has been designed to fit into existing prescribing and dispensing workflows. And uh, one of the most common questions that we receive is around the provision of Schedule 8 medicines with electronic prescriptions. So I'll touch on a little bit of that, an example of that um, next. But essentially, electronic prescriptions are available for, for all or most med medicines. So that includes PBS medicines, private scripts and authority prescriptions. But um, of course, they are available for Schedule 8 medicines. And um, this is just an example of, of how that might be done. So it is a different process to paper prescriptions, but I have spoken to doctors who have used the system um, with, with um, prescribing S8 medicines, and they've said it's quite easy and streamlined to issue these through an electronic prescription. So at the moment, you have your process in place to endorse the prescription details in handwriting, and there is an electronic equivalent available, um, which meets the, the state requirements of issuing these medicines safely. So to meet the legal requirements, as a prescriber, you'll need to re-authenticate the prescription with a password to generate the electronic prescription for a Schedule 8 medicine. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like now, which has a screenshot of the clinical information system. So it might look different for different software products, but the concept will stay the same. So for controlled medicines, there's this uh, extra validation step that I suppose it is equivalent to endorsing the prescription details in handwriting. And instead for an electronic prescription, you'll now validate that prescription by entering your password a second time in your software product. And your software will automatically prompt you to do this if you have um, that, that type of medicine selected. Now that is an important reminder as well to use very strong passwords um, and passphrases in your clinical information system and making sure that you're not sharing these passwords among staff members and that they are unique to you as well. Now moving on, I just want to highlight a few different features um, that do support the security of the system. And the technical solution for electronic prescriptions has been designed with security at the front of mind. So a few of the security me mechanisms um, that are listed on the screen. Um, one of the most important, I think, is that only conformance software products can generate and dispense electronic prescriptions. So that means that the software products that you use has to pass a test to demonstrate that it can um, use the form of encryption that electronic prescriptions use and also validate um, healthcare identifiers. So making sure there's a secure connection to the healthcare identifiers service, which is the mechanism in which the system will identify the practice, um, the provider, and also the patient um, where the care is being delivered. The prescription information, um, as I've said before, it is encrypted and the the contents of the SMS and the email are minimal. So we don't have too, too much sort of patient detail available on those um, QR code tokens. It is um, only that sensitive information that can be retrieved by a pharmacy once that QR code scans using a conformant um, dispensing software. Additional to that too um, are audit logs as well. So um, electronic prescriptions do have an audit log of different um, prescribed and dispensed events. Now further to these technical elements that support security, there is an additional layer of protection with where that um, electronic prescriptions are required to meet both Commonwealth and um, state and territory legislation as well. And electronic prescriptions do align with the Privacy Act too.
Now here are a number of different scenarios um, which a patient might experience. So there are a few different frequently asked questions that we've received and um, I'll take us through the scenarios and the, um, the way that we can resolve that. So the first is that what happens if a patient deletes a token from their device and we know how easy it can be to delete an email or to delete a text message. So in this case, um, the prescriber can resend the original token to the patient and this is quite an easy process um, we can and reissue that within your clinical software at the click of a button. Um, if it is the case that the patient deletes the token and it's a prescription repeat, it would be the pharmacy that um, might be resending that repeat token, which they'll have the capability to do so within their software. The second point there is that the token has been sent to the wrong email um, or the wrong phone number. So this is just a reminder that it is quite important to make sure that we're collecting all the right demographic information from the patient, making sure we have their correct email address or mobile phone number if we're sending them electronic prescriptions, which um, you can roll out within your reception staff to sort of validate that sort of information. However, if it is sent in error, um, you can of course reverse that and um, through your prescribing software, you can cancel the prescription and then generate a new token to, to be sent to the correct um, contact details. And once you cancel that token, um, we had a look at those screenshots towards the start of the presentation where that QR code won't be available anymore. So the, if you cancel the prescription, then if it was sent to the wrong destination, that person can't go and get that, that delete, um, dispensed. It will only have a, a sort of error message saying that the prescription has been ceased by the prescriber. That third point is um, what happens if the patient's unable to receive an electronic prescription token as they don't have a smartphone and we know that that is quite common. So there are um, alternatives in place. The patient might provide their carer's contact details to receive the electronic prescription on their behalf or they can of course elect to receive a standard paper prescription. So uh, that's just to reinforce that electronic prescriptions are an option. So they might not be suitable for everyone, um, but they can of course be sent to a carer and you can also um, print a QR code and that will that can be used just as, as a electronic version of the QR code can be used. Now, moving on, how do we communicate to our patients that our practice is ready to prescribe electronic prescriptions. So on the screen here, I have some examples of a number of different communication resources that we have available that you can use in your practice. And this consists of flyers or window stickers. And there's also um, digital assets that are available too, which might be the case if your practice uses sort of email communications to your patients or or communicating different changes on your website. So all these communication resources are free and available on a print on demand portal. And the login details um, will make sure that they're sent out in a follow up email, or you can reach out to the PHN or the digital health agency to, to receive the login details for that print on demand portal as well. So now we'll touch on the different readiness steps that your practice need to complete in order to uh, prescribe electronic prescriptions. So you probably have already completed this, but it, I think it is quite handy to understand what is required in order to generate an electronic prescription because it does reinforce the different security mechanisms available. And also a few of these different points need to be maintained on an ongoing basis as well. So the first point there is that your organisation is registered in the Healthcare Identifiers Service and that you have a HPIO. Now that HPIO, it's a um, 16 digit number that, that identifies the organisation or the practice in the Healthcare Identifiers Service and it's a registration that you complete in order to participate in electronic prescriptions. Um, it's also the same registration that you might have completed previously to um, participate in the My Health Records system as well. So it is important you have a HPIO and that number and the details are recorded in your clinical information system. The second point there is confirming that your software product has a digital certificate installed. So you might have heard of a NASH certificate or a Medicare PKI certificate. And essentially it's the key to unlock electronic prescriptions in your software. So making sure that um, all the right encryption processes are in place and that we can securely enable electronic prescriptions and the functionality within your software. 
That third point is talking about the prescription delivery service connection. So you might have heard of ERX or MediSecure before, and you probably already use these in your practice. And essentially that's the repository of where all the, the complete prescription information is being stored. So the legal form of prescription is stored in that prescription delivery service and um, essentially your prescribing software is sending the prescription date details up to that prescription delivery service in order for pharmacies to access it through their conformant um, dispensing product. The next point is making sure you've installed the most upgraded um, version of your software and making sure that you have all the right healthcare identifiers in place. So um, you do have to identify yourself as a prescriber within your software and making sure that your HPII is correctly recorded in your clinical information product. So you might have also heard of that, um, that acronym before, it's healthcare provider identifier for an individual and every single um, prescribing clinician will have a HPII and that's just a serial number that needs to be recorded in your software. Then we're going to make sure that we're updating our patients and their carers contact details within the software too. So ensuring we have all the right phone numbers and email addresses so that the um, tokens, if we do decide to send tokens, are sent to the correct destination. And um, I think it's a really good opportunity to involve your um, admin staff in that process with making sure that they're validating emails and phone numbers as well to contact the patients. And we just have a reminder to stay up to date with the relevant state and territory legislation. Um, and further to that, we have another session coming up soon run by the Digital Health Agency on specific rules in place for Victoria as well. Um, and then that second point too is to discuss with your team what is um, your electronic prescriptions approach, how are we communicating this to our patients um, and having a discussion about your experiences with um, sort of providing electronic prescriptions so far. It is also really important that you're reaching out to local pharmacies. We saw before that um, there has been quite a strong uptake in Victoria, so it is quite safe to assume that your local pharmacies will be connected with electronic prescriptions. However, we still encourage you to reach out to the pharmacies to, to let them know that you're engaging with electronic prescriptions to make sure that they're maintaining that connection so that the patients have um, the most choice to go to any pharmacy they want in order to receive that electronic prescription. Now I mentioned just now that we have a session coming up on the specifics of the Victorian legislation relating to S8 medicines. So we do receive quite a lot of uh, questions relating to how do we generate electronic prescriptions for S8s. Um, so we are running a dedicated webinar happening on the 2nd of March um, and the login details to that will be on the Digital Health Agency's website and also will be sent out in the link to this um, presentation once you receive the deck soon as well. Now finally, before we answer some questions about um, electronic prescriptions, I just want to highlight a few different resources that are available. So we have the Australian Digital Health Agency's website with um, information for prescribers and dispensers with links to all the upcoming webinars relating to electronic prescriptions. Now, um, we had Joe speak before about health pathways as well. So I do encourage you to use the login details in the chat function to log into health pathways because the PHN does have some um, electronic prescriptions and some other digital health resources available on the PHN's health pathways site um, that you can have a look at as well. Then down the bottom, I think it's important to note that um, with this project being co-delivered with the Department of Health, there's quite a lot of policy advice um, relating to electronic prescriptions on the Department of Health's website too that you can have a look at there. Okay, so I'll now um, just pass back over to Helene to see if we've had any questions come through um, and we'll just run through those for a few minutes before we jump over to pathology electronic requesting. Thanks, April. Uh, a couple of questions. First one, can we send e-scripts directly to pharmacies for nursing home patients? So the uh, electronic prescriptions, it's been designed so that um, 
you're not sort of sending electronic prescriptions directly to the pharmacy for most cases. We do understand that if you have an arrangement with a aged care facility, um, then it might be appropriate to do that. But um, in most cases, it's really important that you're sending the electronic prescription to the patient just to avoid script channeling directly to pharmacies. So um, yeah, absolutely, it's appropriate for aged care um, and that sort of thing, but it, it isn't a, a sort of behavior that you do all the time with sending um, the electronic prescriptions directly to a pharmacy. Uh, next question. With an AC, ASL, can the patient get scripts dispensed from any pharmacy or only their registered pharmacist? So they will be able to go to any pharmacy that's connected to electronic prescriptions. You can add any amount of pharmacies as a delegate to your active script list. Um, as I went through the process before, how patients will have to register at a pharmacy initially so they can go to any pharmacy of their choice to re initially register for the ASL and that's where they'll provide consent to have their subsequent prescriptions posted to their ASL and then following that if they decide to go to a different pharmacy all they'll have to do is um, sort of visit that pharmacy or contact them and go through the same consent process in order to give those pharmacists ac um, access to the ASL and um, of course you can uh, take back that access to us. So if a patient no longer wants to visit a pharmacy, they can um, remove access to that pharmacy from the ASL. For a patient attending a specialist consultation where they might have shown their scripts as confirmation of what medications slash doses they take, how would this work with e-scripts? Oh yes, okay. So. Um, with that, so I, my understanding of the question would be, say if a patient went to a specialist practice and took their physical script to the practice and um, showing them you know, what, what sort of medicines they're on. Um, in this case, they can do that with electronic prescriptions because it has the medicine name and strength on the, on the um, prescription and um, they also might have access to the active script list or uh, might use a medication app to use that as well. Um, but also those details would um, be on sort of like referral forms and, and things like that as well. So um, there is prescription details on the, the QR code. It's just not um, sort of like the demographic details won't be there for the patient. Is there a database of pharmacies who accept electronic tokens? So there isn't a database because um, it would be quite hard to maintain a list of pharmacies connected to eScripts because um, maybe their certificates would expire or, um, you know, there's different tech, um, technological sort of aspects in participating with electronic prescriptions. So there's no current up-to-date list. However, um, with the statistics that we've shown before, there is quite a large uptake in Victoria. So you can assume that um, most are connected. My advice would be to reach out to them directly, um, but there's no yeah, list available, unfortunately. For children, can the script token be sent to slash held by both separated parents to seek dispensation, regardless of who is currently carer? Um, that is a good question and I'm not 100% sure of the specifics. I assume that you'd be able to send the token to both um, sort of carers because um, that is the case where you can forward tokens onto people as well. Um, I'm not quite sure of the sort of background um, so I can't be 100% certain of that question but in like looking at it from a technical aspect you can send it to two different parties and um, sort of on that note as well, it's important to keep in mind that it might be a good solution because both carers could receive that prescription and there'll be no details of the address for the patient um, or things like Medicare card numbers or anything like that on the um, actual token there for them. How can nursing home scripts sent directly to the pharmacy be backdated? Um, nursing home scripts, how can they be backdated? Well, at the moment you have your regular sort of owing Markov process with um, sending scripts to the pharmacy. It wouldn't be any 
there wouldn't be much difference with electronic prescriptions because um, it would be the same sort of mark-off pro process if you're backdating prescriptions. It might even be an easier process if um, that is the case. You're sending a prescription through to a pharmacy in order to mark off like a backdated um, existing owing supply. Uh, that's all the questions at this stage, April. Excellent. So um, thanks, Helene. And we'll we'll take some questions too soon. So if, if you have any more thoughts about electronic prescriptions, please post them in the questions and answers um, box. But at the moment, I'll just move on to going through some more details on pathology electronic prescriptions, which is another digital health tool that you can use in your practice. But um, it's really important to keep in mind that this is completely separate to electronic prescriptions. So if you do ask a question um, about pathology you're requesting or electronic prescriptions, just make it clear in the questions bar um, which topic we're going to be touching on. So moving on from electronic prescriptions, which was part of this medicine safety pillar, um, the other digital health topic that we'll quickly touch on is electronic um, requesting for pathology reports, which falls under the My Health Record priority, which aims to have health information available wherever and whenever it's needed. So touching on a few different My Health Record statistics before we jump into pathology. So we're cu currently seeing some meaningful use um, of the My Health Record system and some stats in this graphic here demonstrate that we have a really strong connection to the My Health Record system in primary care. We have most pharmacies registered and using My Health Record and also um, most GPs are registered with a, a significant proportion of those using My Health Record as well. And that's increasing um, quite quickly at the moment. Then um, if we move outside of primary care too, we have quite um, the vast majority of public hospitals using My Health Record as well. And there's a very strong connection with private hospitals too. And we do have um, teams working at the agency to help um, encourage the use of My Health Record within areas like, like private hospitals. Then if we look at the system on more of a document level, we see a significant amount of clinical documents being uploaded to the My Health Record. And I think the combined total now is over 2 billion documents within My Health Record. So there's a wealth of different clinical information um, available in the system ready now to use. So we can see that there's um, a significant amount of dispense records and medicines information and discharge summaries. But one of the most um, used documents that we see providers and patients um, engage with and find most beneficial is access to pathology reports. And we can see that at the moment we have over 80 million um, pathology reports available in the My Health Record system. Now, the benefit of having these pathology reports available is that it's going to reduce the unnecessary testing of pathology reports if we have better access to that information. It's going to save time for um, clinicians and admin staff in chasing information. And also there's patient benefits for accessing pathology report information um, because they'll have view over that um, sort of data if they are connected to their own My Health record as well. We are presented with a challenge though for pathology reports going to the My Health Record and that's that at the moment it isn't an automatic process to upload um, pathology to the My Health Record system. So when you request pathology in your practice, it might not go to the My Health Record as it depends on a number of different technical requirements um, relating to the pathology company. So first, um, the pathology provider must be connected to the My Health Record system. And then second, your practice must be enabled with electronic requesting. So We'll now have a look at which pathology providers are connected to the My Health Record system. And we have this information publicly available on the My Health Record website, which I'll just pop up right now. And um, essentially, it's just a list of the different um, pathology and um, diagnostic imaging providers that are connected to the My Health Record system. And I'll quickly scroll down to Victoria. So you can have a look at this um, at a later sort of time, but we can see that there's a number of different path labs that are connected to the My Health Record system. And on this list, we do have some of the pathology companies are in um, bold with an asterisk next to it. And this means that they have a additional requirement in order to enable electronic pathology requesting. So they do um, 
sort of require you to make an active process to enable electronic requesting in your practice in order for their reports to be then sent to the My Health Records system. So this is essential in making sure there's an electronic validation of the patient's information. And then um, of course, then it enables the um, upload of results to the My Health Records system. So what does pathology electronic requesting actually look like um, and how do we set it up in the practice? So this here, it's an example of an electronic pathology request. Now it's the same as your normal pathology requests. Um, however, you'll notice a difference here with there's a barcode down the bottom here. It can be anywhere on the um, pathology request though. So the barcode, it's not only um, beneficial as it means you're enabling a My Health Record upload, but it also helps expedite the pathology processing time for the patient. So it means that the pathology requester can scan the barcode rather than manually entering patient information, which um, in turn reduces the risk of transcription errors. So e-requesting this system, it is intended to speed up the delivery of results to GPs, as well as streamline the patient's experience with faster collection, less waiting, and also lower chance of transcription errors. But um, of course, um, as I've said before, it's not an automatic process of pathology reports having this electronic barcode um, enabled within, within that request form. So in order to enable electronic requesting in your practice, um, you just have to confirm whether the pathology companies you send requests to require this extra step of enabling pathology electronic requesting. And then um, you can contact those labs and initiate um, enabling e-requesting. It just means that there's a short setup process within your software product to print these barcodes um, when you are sending off those um, or printing off those pathology requests. So this has to be done only once on a practice level. So um, you might get your practice manager to facilitate this process, but um, essentially it's just a, a phone call or an, or an email to the pathology company to mention that your practice wants to engage with pathology electronic requesting. They'll do the setup and, and help you with the setup or your um, IT company can assist with that too, with um, enabling the feature within your software so that these barcodes are then printed on your request forms, um, which then is enabling that um, sort of streamlined pathology connection process and also meaning that there's a validation of patient information so that we can enable a My Health Record upload. Now I've um, whizzed through the pathology electronic requesting information quite quickly. Um, what I'll do now is, Helene, have you seen any other questions come through on um, electronic prescriptions or e-requesting so far? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, just regarding the last question about the um, back in nursing homes, scripts be backdated, pharmacy be backdated. There was yes. just a comment, our software doesn't enable us to backdate these scripts. Okay. Um, yeah, so in that case, um, you won't be able to backdate it. It might be a process for the pharmacy to mark it off different, but um, I'm not too sure um, what the process would be with that one. And another question, following from database question, you mentioned database would be hard to maintain due to pharmacy certificates expiring. How often does that happen? Would best practice be to call the pharmacy for each patient to ensure they are accepting tokens on that day? Um, no, so you won't be able to, you, it's, um, it would be ridiculous to call the pharmacy every day, I understand that, but um, the certificates, they, they are valid for around about two years. It depends which certificate you're using. It might be two years. It could be up to five years, I think. But um, it isn't sort of a, a thing that's going to expire quite quickly. Um, I was just mentioning that it's um, not really possible for us to have like a federated list of pharmacies enabled with electronic prescriptions when there's a number of different dependencies with that information like um, for example, the, the certificates expiring or the pharmacy closing where um, there would need to be 
you know, dedicated resources in order to do that and maintain that list constantly, which um, at the moment it isn't available. So um, I think that the pharmacy certificate isn't really something that um, general practice needs to worry about. It's just a sort of matter of reaching out to the pharmacy. And if anything changes on their end, I think that then they can contact your practice to say that, you know, they're not able to do electronic prescriptions anymore um, or that sort of thing and have, have that sort of open line of communication with local pharmacies. Okay, for e-pathology requests, do patients get an SMS with a token on their phone as well as just like e-prescribing? Um, no, so there's no um, sort of message to the to the patient in pathology e-requesting. Where that code is, I know that it is quite confusing when we're talking about different codes with both e-prescriptions and, and pathology, but that barcode, it, it only lies on the pathology request, the paper pathology request. There's no sort of patient copy. Um, and I, I mean, I do understand that they are taking that request through to the pathology collection site. However, there's um, no text message version of the code for the patient with um, electronic pathology. Next question. I'm still unsure how this is electronic referral for pathology. Do we still have to scan the pathology slip and email the patient the request form for pathology to scan the barcode? So it won't be a completely electronic process. You'll still have paper involved in the pathology requesting process. Um, when we talk about electronic requesting, it's it's essentially only really referring to that barcode being on a paper script, which I do understand that that does sound a little bit misleading, but um, it just means the electronic transfer of information. So, for example, that, that those details on the pathology request are being uploaded to a server that's um, held by the pathology company, and then when the patient's having that um, pathology collected, they'll give the, the you know, request form to the collector, they'll scan that barcode instead of manually transcribing that information, and then it's going to download the pathology information in the request form to the um, clinical information system that the pathology company uses. Dorovich Pathology have only recently got on board with uploading results to the My Health Record in our area. Now this is up and running, is there any reason they should not be able to activate e-requesting and doctors can use it? No, so I think that we saw just previously, and I'll open up just to confirm that, um, Dorovich is enabled with um, electronic requesting in some areas. Um, so if, if that is your area, then that they should be able to enable electronic requesting once you reach out to them. Um, and sort of initiate that process. Um, do patients need to have a My Health record to participate in e-prescribing? And if so, isn't that discrimination against patients who opted out of My Health record? So a patient doesn't need a My Health record to do electronic prescriptions. So um, it's really important to keep that in mind with that um, My Health record is a separate sort of program to electronic prescriptions and patients and Australians, they, they still maintain the choice of whether they have a My Health record or not. They can cancel their record at any time. They can, um, you know, opt back in if they, if they wish to do so. But electronic prescriptions, it is separate. So say if you do have a patient that doesn't want a My Health record and definitely doesn't want um, one in the future, they can still have um, an electronic prescription because it doesn't use the same sort of information that's um, you know connected to the My Health Record system. It's it's a different um, program completely. There is no further questions at this stage. Okay, great. So I'll just before I hand back over to you, Helene, to close the session, I'll just pop up some um, contact details where you can reach out to. The digital health agency or find out more information on the My Health Records system too. Um, we do have some links on the digital health agency's website to some further 
um, webinars on the topics um, like electronic prescriptions and um, and some other things available there as well. With My Health Record, if you do want to know a little bit more about that system, there's some software walkthroughs that we're going to be running starting in a week or two where it's going to take you through how to use the My Health Record in a simulated um, best practice or medical director um, environment. So that, that is something that we'll be starting up soon. And um, of course, there's also some information relating to electronic prescriptions on the Australian Digital Health Agency website. Um, but uh, as I mentioned before, I do really encourage you all to um, check out your local Health Pathways website too, which has the login details in the chat, which um, I'm sure has a directory to different um, information resources available for electronic prescriptions as well. So I'll hand back over to you, Helene, just to um, close the session off. And I think we've finished a little bit early this time. Thanks, April. That was really, really informative. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, to the participants, don't forget to fill out the evaluation, um, the questions and stuff there for me, please. And what you thought of the session, any comments, and any future education that you may like the West Vic PHN to put on. So thanks again April and we will see you again. Bye everyone.